Well, good day, my friends. As you see, we are entering Minnesota. I just figured, you know, I wanted to do a couple of fun vlogs before I started heading south, and so I wanted, I wanted to actually do this one for a while, and I think if you like 70s television, you'll love this. There's only one show that we really think of, I think, when you think of Minneapolis, Minnesota. She could turn the world on with her smile. We're gonna go see some Mary Tyler Moore locations today. Days of Jordan the Lion and you all, it begins right now. There's a ton of cool stuff to see here, but we are actually gonna be focusing on being down in this area over here. There it is, the Mary Tyler Moore house. You saw it in the series. You'd see, you know, when Mary is starting her new life coming to town, we'd see her car driving down this road and passing by it. And you'd also see her get into a cab. One point, the uh, cab would actually be right, parked right over here facing that direction. She'd get in the cab and you could see the house in the shot. Very iconic house. Of course, this was uh, Rhoda's house also. Mary lived on the second floor and Rhoda lived in the attic. Very cool to see. And very interesting how the show came about because the show was ultra successful, but everything that made it successful was what the studio was afraid of and what they tried to stop before it even started. And so many things happened in just the, you know, the origination of this show that almost stopped it from being a success altogether. Now how this all kind of came to be was, um, you know, Mary Tyler Moore was very successful on the Dick Van Dyke show. And the Dick Van Dyke show ended in 1965. And for the next couple of years, she would do just kind of some pretty, as she would say, some pretty forgettable projects. Um, she did do a movie with Elvis, but other than that, nothing really to speak of. And so Dick Van Dyke was asked to do a special. And so he decided to do a special called Dick Van Dyke and the Other Woman. And he invited Mary Tyler Moore to be on this special with him, basically sharing most of the special, highlighting her abilities, dancing, singing. And CBS liked her so much, they offered her a 13 episodic show, 13 episodes for her own show. And uh, she happily accepted. But then basically all of the trouble started from there. So her husband Grant was actually a studio head at 20th Century and um, he kind of secretly, his boss gave him the okay, he kind of secretly helped run the show, Mary Tyler Moore show behind the scenes. So when it all started, they decided to have it take place here in Minneapolis because they felt like it was a growing city. It was a place that wasn't really used on television shows like New York, LA, Chicago, all those places were heavily used so much they thought this would be kind of a fresh look and they wanted a place that had four seasons a year so they could take advantage of that with the storylines. Now originally they were going to have Mary, you know, because at the time the show was signed, it was 1970, um, Mary was 34 in real life and they were having her set as a 30 year old. And the original concept that the writers, Alan Burns and James L. Brooks came up with would be that Mary was a divorcee. But CBS immediately had a problem with that because I guess at the time, Mary Tyler Moore herself was saying that divorce wasn't something that was as accepted as it is now. Plus, she was so well known for being with Dick Van Dyke, they were afraid that all of the people that watched this show would think that she divorced Dick Van Dyke. And even though the writer said, no, 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 we're gonna have her ex in the show and show that even his parents liked Mary more, they still said, no, we don't want to do that. So they decided to make her, you know, basically a 30 year old that's starting a new job in a new town and basically just starting from scratch all over again, starting her life anew. So they got an absolutely legendary cast, Ed Asner, Cloris Leachman, 
Betty White, I mean, and these were, Ted Knight, I mean, these were some really, really good actors and really funny people, but every character that they wrote and cast, CBS thought, well, this is a little too extreme. They thought Rhoda was too feminist, and that's kind of what they were going for, because you see, the time CBS was known for having a lot of successful shows, but they were all like um, Petticoat Junction, Green Acres, Hee Haw, they were all kind of what some people would say were like, um, you know, Bible Belt shows or whatever, and the head of CBS, the new head, he had just taken over in 69, um, Bob Woods, he decided that he wanted to capture a younger, hipper demographic, and so they thought, you know, hey, signing Mary Tyler Moore, who's a hot, you know, actress, very successful, very likable, that they thought this would just be a slam dunk, but all the ideas that were being brought to them, they really, didn't enjoy. And right at the top of that list was Ed Asner because Ed Asner was known as a dramatic actor and not a comedic actor. And they were putting him in a comedic role. But the casting director, she really felt strongly and cast Ed Asner. And so the network said, you know, hey, to sell this show, since nobody knows anything about it to our affiliates, we need you guys to film a, you know, like one scene from it. And so the writers decided they picked their favorite scene, which was a scene between Mary and Lou Grant at Asner. And so it was, they wanted the show to be a three camera show shot with a live studio audience. And what the studio told them to shoot was a one camera with partial set. And, um, and so that's what they ended up being forced to do. The man who shot it, the cameraman, lit Mary really badly and so just everything about it looked really bad and there really didn't seem to be any comedy. Uh, Lou Grant didn't come off as funny as he had in his second audition that got him the part and so the studio when they saw this immediately called the casting director and said fire Ed Asner and recast him and she said I can't do that. She said you guys put him in a situation where you know he wasn't going to succeed. I think that he really will be good at this. Um, you just got to put him in front of a live studio audience and they really had no preparation. They hadn't even really done a rehearsal. They had went in and just basically staged it for 30 minutes before they filmed it. They didn't, they never rehearsed the scene. So she refused to recast him. So then they had to go ahead and they were going to do a rehearsal in front of a studio audience before they filmed their first show. And so they did this on a Tuesday and everything went wrong. Um, they were gonna film the show on Friday, so they were doing the rehearsal on Tuesday in front of an audience, but unfortunately, the air conditioning broke down in one of the hottest days in California that year. So the audience was really, really miserable and unfortunately the microphones weren't working so they couldn't really hear anything. So they weren't laughing at anything and then once again the studio was really in fear that this was just gonna be a bomb and word got around town. They were already, before it even aired, they were already talking about what was gonna replace it. So the rehearsal was a total, total flop the studio had wanted basically everything changed at one point. They wanted the writers fired. They didn't want certain actors. You know, this was every, and they were seemingly being proven to be right. And when they did that rehearsal afterward, Mary cried. She said their whole drive home, she cried in her house all night and her husband, uh, Grant, who was basically, like I said, he was kind of secretly running the show. She said she heard him get up and go to the phone and call someone at the studio, call someone with the, uh, the production, I think it was the writers, and just said, Mary's upset, fix it. And then when they went in to actually film the episode on that Friday, they checked all the microphones, they made sure the air conditioning was working, and everything went off flawlessly. They got a great recording of their first show, the crowd loved it. Um, everybody's performance was on par and the show, you know, they had what they thought was a great show, but here was the problem. They had signed this deal in January and the studio would put together the schedule for the upcoming September programs in February. So they had already put them in a time slot based on a couple of the scripts before the show was ever cast. So 
they were in a really bad time slot. Um, it was actually a Tuesday night time slot across from Mod Squad, which was the most popular show on television. So I guess at the time, you know, being that I mentioned that Bob Woods, the head of the studio, had decided he wanted to take everything in a different direction, he had hired a man to kind of help do all this. And when Fred came to LA, he saw the episode that they had filmed of the Mary Tyler Moore show and called Bob Wood and said, I know you're gonna go crazy and I know it's August, but we gotta change the schedule and we gotta put this Mary Tyler Moore show, I think it's a hit, but where we have it, it will absolutely die. We have to change it to Saturday night. And so they went ahead and did that and this was kind of like one of the benchmark shows for CBS that ended up, you know, like I mentioned, they ended up um, canceling all of their rural shows and going with these young urban shows and it was kind of all based off of the success of this show of Mary and the feminist movement and just kind of standing on her own. I saw several interviews with cast members and they said that everybody on the cast and crew got along famously. Nobody ever really had any disagreements. And uh, even on the outside of the studio, Studio 2 at Television City where they would film, there's a plaque that said the Mary Tyler Moore show was filmed here with um, uh, assembly of talented actors and friends and that says a lot because a lot of people just look at the show as a job and uh, this was actually a family and this show went from 1970 until 1977 with several spin-offs. So unfortunately when the show debuted it was not an immediate hit and it got a lot of bad reviews and Mary says she remembers every bad review of her entire career so she really took it hard, but as the show went on, it became more successful. People really liked the writing, really liked the cast and the characters, and CBS eventually started to back off and give them more freedom, and then um, Mary and her husband started Mary Tyler Moore Productions. Kind of took over control of the whole show. Now, if you remember the opening credits, there's a couple places that we see Mary around town, so we're gonna go check out a couple of them, including her statue. So right out here is where we see Mary walking by the water in the opening credits with the, at that time when they were filming it, there was snow behind her. Who can take a nothing day and suddenly make it all seem And then she was walking down this walkway had trees on both sides but right now you can see at this time of the year the ones all the leaves have fallen off but she's been walking right along here a couple of interesting things about this show when Henry Winkler moved out to Los Angeles from New York and started auditioning the very first part that he ever got was on the Mary Tyler Moore show. He played a guest that Rhoda brought to, I think Thanksgiving, who had just been fired from his job. Steve, this is Mary Richards. Hello. Come Hello. On. Rhoda, uh, could I talk to you for just a moment? Yes, and I wanted to talk to you too. And I mentioned that CBS was always kind of intruding. At one point they told the writers not to do an episode that they had done with Rhoda's mom. They said, don't film this. And, um, they called Mary Tyler Moore's husband and said, can they do that? And he said, well, they can tell you not to do it, but they can't stop you from filming. And I think it's a good episode. I think you should film it. They did film it and the writers won an Emmy award for that episode. Going into the city to see where Mary worked. Oh, you can see the Fauché tower up there. That's in some of the intros for some of the seasons. I've been down here once before looking for it, but I couldn't find the statue, and then I found out later that they had moved it inside of a building after Mary Tyler Moore passed for a while, just for safety. Okay, so Mary's statue is on 7th Street, but we're gonna go to 7th and Marquette. We're gonna make a left on Marquette right here and uh, see our office building. Right over here was WJM TV for Mary Works. It's the RSM building.
And up there is where she'd deal with Lou Grant and Murray and the whole gang, Ted. <laughs> so they originally wanted like a young, good looking, dark haired anchor to be, you know, to for Mary to have to deal with. But Ted Knight came in and just killed it in the audition and they thought he was just perfect for it. So, famous scene where Mary is taking off her hat and throwing it actually just a block away and we're, we see this Dayton store kind of in some of the quick shots for the intro. Look at their awesome window display since we're going past it. And on our way down to where she throws her hat and where the statue is, there's a shopping center right over here. This is where she's doing her shopping. <laughs> when we see her in the intro of some of those seasons shopping, it's in there. Which I believe these were also the escalators from the later intros. And also, uh, I've been in here before because I vlogged a scene from Purple Rain. She's doing her shopping inside of here. So we'll go up the same escalator she did, but the way they filmed it from her was looking at her getting off the escalators. Kind of a shot, kind of like this. And every little movement you show. All right, let's go see the statue. It's right outside. This is a very interesting structure for sure. You see this Dayton's in the intros as well when the camera's kind of doing those quick cuts. And interesting story about this, there's her statue. Interesting story is that when they filmed this, when they did the intro, they came out here, did it in the winter, and it was freezing cold. And this was the last shot of everything, was them doing this, throwing her Tam into the sky. And the director of who was making the intro, you know, he had this idea of showing her starting over in this city and everything. And he said this was his idea as though, you know, like in graduation when you throw your cap to start a whole new life for yourself, that was the idea behind this. And so they brought her out here to film this and look at that. This city loves her. I believe um, it was Nick at Night who got this all done, but um, got this memorialized here. But the city just loves her. But the story was that they uh, they didn't tell anybody they were filming this, so they had the camera set up like over there with a telephoto lens. They were filming it, filming her crossing the street over here, which. That's what we see in the background. And when she was walking across with all the foot traffic with everybody, she threw the hat up in the air and you see a lady behind her look all horrified. Make it after all. She said she ran into that lady years later and the lady said she thought she was throwing her hat in the air and like killing herself, like so that a car would run her over, like ending it all. But that's actually what we see in the background of that famous hat throw. Writers said that they distinctly remember when they were editing, watching the edit of the footage from all this stuff. They remember laughing because after every take that they would do of Mary throwing her hat up into the air, the footage would then have her scrambling on the ground to pick up the hat before the traffic <laughs> rode over it. So pretty cool to have a statue to this moment. So where this all happens, her office would have been that building right there. That was where the studios were. The shopping scenes and everything were done inside of here. And I believe she would have thrown her hat in the air right here. Right where we're walking through. It's cool that the statue's back out here. And I love this old Dayton store. This place is just so classic. Look up here. Yeah. 
Just to show you a couple more angles and some details. Do you have her holding her bag? Wearing the boots, their scarf. For those of you that love details. And I wouldn't say it looks like identical to her, but it's it's good. I know some people want to see the real star of the show, Ja, so we're taking him out to a local park here. I'm sure people have missed you. You think so? Hey, Ja, how are you doing today, my friend? Are you happy? What a good boy. All right, my friends, we're going to call it a day from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I want to thank Tina Dunn, Dan Herman, Rick, and Terry Straw for becoming my newest Patreons. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for your support, and we will see you next time. Have a great night, and goodbye. Mm -hmm.